we have one part to go. A panel, sizzling panel. So, <laughs> all the speakers, please welcome. I'll be moderating. <laughs> um, do we have enough chairs? Oh, excellent. So some questions. You can ask anything of anybody. I hope that it's related to today's topic. <laughs> uh, can you take the microphone running thing? Because yeah, but we need the audio for the cameras. Let's take one of yeah. So there's a question in the middle. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kim Salmi. I'm from the Helsinki shipyard. Uh, concerning these uh, floating uh, nuclear power stations and concerning the development of the of the regulation. Uh, if there is a uh, work going on for the, the regulation uh, development, is it considering already the aspect that uh, the power station would be on top of the water? I mean the safety factors and, and so on. And is it also taking uh, consideration the, the existing regulation on the ship side? The answer is no. I mean that uh, something like a year ago, with Lisa, Jaakko and myself, we took these SOLAS requirements and we studied them a bit and then we tried to illustrate to ourselves what kind of, you could say, demands there are. But we have not done anything uh, more. And uh, I, won't say, I would say the same from the Stuck side. Is there someone from Stuck? No. I, I think we are just beginning in, in this field. So because there was also the discussion about the costs. And if, if you want to go to the lower costs, you have to have more standardized uh, things. You cannot uh, uh, make everything, once again, uh, all, the, all the certifications and, and so on. No smaller party will, will participate on the, on the competition or the, the prices will, will skyrocket, basically. Thanks. Yeah, this is a really critical question, um, and we agree with you that w more work needs to be done. And um, we're seeing a lot of interest from um, regulatory uh, bodies, including the IAEA um, and uh, assurance entities like Lloyd's Register, for example, that have um, marine and nuclear regulatory expertise. Um, in figuring out um, where the existing regulatory regime in the marine environment and the nuclear environment can be applicable to this application for marine nuclear and where there are gaps that would need to be filled and in figuring out a uh, interaction between the regulators from the nuclear sector and the marine sector to start creating some visibility across those two um, communities um, and understanding what the interactions will be between them in this new application. Um, and finally, I would say that, yes, you're absolutely right. The, the regulatory pathway is really the kind of critical issue in terms of, you know, whether this is actually, you know, how feasible it is, how fast can it happen, what would the cost implications be? And in, since we published the Missing Link to a Livable Climate report, we've been approached by several very large oil producing uh, companies that we've all heard of, um, and also countries that are oil producers um, that are interested in transitioning from fossil fuels production to synthetic fuels production. And the conclusions that they've all reached, they're all on different stages of this journey of realizing that they cannot match their current production with renewables. And w they've scoured the world for an alternative way of, of meeting their current production levels 
um, with other technologies and they're all arriving at the conclusion that nuclear technologies, because they have high capacity factors, they produce high temperature heat and power at very low costs, at very high capacity factors, is the technology that could enable them to achieve this. And offshore or marine applications for nuclear, shipyard manufactured nuclear plants, is a way that they can achieve the costs and the scale that are needed for their current f fossil fuels production. But the one question that they will have is, what's the regulatory pathway to enable this to happen? And if we can resolve that, then I think we're going to see you know, very large actors that have historically not really operated in the nuclear sector starting to really mobilize. I could comment just that the seabed standing option then solves a lot of those questions. But at the same time, if you want to have it as a floatable export product, then, then in seismic areas, there might be a very good case when you have it floating because then you are off, off, uh, off some of the issues. So it can actually give a, let's say, option to areas that would be very expensive to build otherwise. More questions? Yes, uh, Reko Antti Soinen, CEO of Aker Arctic Technology Company. So we, we are an engineering company working mainly on the icebreakers and have, a, of course, long background also on the icebreaking vessel, which you all know are kind of the civil, only, only uh, nuclear powered vessel, vessels in the civil uh, use. Uh, that's, of course, today in, in Russia only. But that's uh, some background for our cooperation also with, with Rosatom in the past. So, so we've been also touched on the, on the nuclear, combining the nuclear and, and marine aspects in, in the past. We also know that there is the already existing floating nuclear power station in use and, and two, two under construction. So, so principally you're kind of the proven technology in many aspects. But the, the, my question also relates a little bit on the regulation, but also what we learned on these uh, licensing principles as, uh, as our involvement in the, in, in the bigger context. So we learned that in, in the nuclear industry there needs to be a license holder. In. It's, it's uh, the organization who will be responsible for the, to, to get in the license for the, for, for the nation in a way for use of the nuclear power or producing the nuclear power. And then other companies involved in the projects uh, uh, don't need that, that license, uh, actually. But uh, my question, if you are thinking about uh, uh, building this kind of the ecosystem or, or, or the, uh, industrial activities in Finland, so, so I, I think then we obviously need some company who would take a lead on that one, and as we don't have any nuclear uh, technology companies in, in Finland. So, so what is the uh, opinion of Rauli or, uh, or key speakers in a way that how, how this could be brought up in, in, in business and commercial wise in, in Finland? Thank you. Well, my answer to that is that that is something that we will have to kind of see and, and discuss and, and approach. This report was mainly meant as a kind of initiator of this discussion because we had none of this discussion in Finland and hopefully from today onwards we will have that discussion and, and we can start to talk to each other and, and see who would like to do what and, and well one of the big questions would be that who will have all the money to pay for, for work and, and, and stuff like that. But yeah, it's, it's in the next steps um, how, how we will go about it if we want to do it. I think that it's worthwhile to at least study more closely the, the, the implications and, and feasibility of these ideas. But yeah, let's see. Um. So it's a great question. Um, we, we've actually been doing a lot of work on this question and, and we think it's uh, reasonable to approach the design of these power plants um, so that you can compete multiple providers to supply the heat source. So we believe that the way the nuclear industry will evolve over time, that the vertically integrated model 
which is currently used, will become is too cumbersome and slow. And at a, in a manufacturing-based environment, you usually have multiple providers for all the key systems, um, both for security of supply and also price competition. And we believe that this is the way we should organize the industry. And if you look at actually the industry, the evolution of industries over time, when they move to high volume and low cost, they actually adopt a kind of horizontal structure. And we believe that this is what will happen in the shipyard manufactured nuclear plant business and that there will become sort of standard sizes and you'll have multiple vendors. Right now, uh, so I, we, Lucid Catalyst does a lot of work and in the kind of advanced nuclear and the nuclear vendors space including we have non-disclosure agreements with most of the companies. We've done detailed cost studies for most of the companies. Actually, one of the things they always ask us is, what size should our reactor be? Now, what kind of company is designing a product without having a good understanding of the size of the product? A company that does not have a very big market and has very little customer contact, okay? Once there is a kind of platform, once you have a competing set of uh, providers providing platforms that you can put the heat sources in, you'll also be able to have competition between the heat source providers. And you'll have a standard spec and so forth. So we actually see that you know, there will be light water systems that are de developed. They might be boiling water. They might be pressurized water. There will also be advanced reactor versions that will be developed, and there'll probably be different sizes. So this is kind of a, you know, looking into the future a little bit. But I think the, the way forward for Finland might be to have a kind of open architecture approach to the heat source and say, you know, we need a heat source that is approximately this size, approximately this power rating, approximately this temperature, and we'd like to talk to Rolls-Royce and New Scale and, you know, um, whoever else uh, about, you know, the Koreans, about providing this kind of a, a reactor for our power plants. And, hmm? Oh, the, yes, the, Kirstie's reminding me there's a, there's, a, there's a, uh, a, an analogy that we like to use, which is that right now, um, the way we design nuclear plants, and actually if you talk to all these nuclear vendors, they all have a nuclear engineering team they start by designing the core, then they design something around the core, like a pressure vessel and a bunch of systems, and then they kind of slow down their work and eventually somebody has to come along and design all the civil engineering that goes around it. And they say, you know, why did the nuclear engineers make this choice and why did they do this and why did they try to fit it into this small a building and, you know, all of these problems. And eventually they get to a design and then they try to build it. And this is kind of like, you know, if you have a kitchen and you want to have a microwave in your kitchen, it's like hiring microwave engineers to design your kitchen. That is actually what's happening today. And uh, what we see as a possibility is that you just basically, you go to Ikea, you get your kitchen, and it has a slot, and the slot is designed for a set of standard microwaves, and then you order the microwave that you want for your kitchen. And it's surprising that we can do this for kitchens, but we can't seem to figure this out for, for delivering these plants. So that's kind of the, the, the vision for the future. May, may I continue from that? Yep. I, I love that idea to just order the kitchen and, and have the space for the microwave. I will embrace that idea of a nuclear technology this evening, because when I go back to my real life, I, it's... We are not that far yet, but it sounds really, really good, and I, uh, I want to take it and and keep it. So, yeah, so. we should we should aim for that definitely. But I I would actually like okay. to answer the question about the license holder issue and and the operation. So I I think Finland is a tiny, tiny, small country, and and we have utilities. We have Fortum, we have TVO, so we have operation experience in Finland. And so I definitely think that we should utilize that. So, so uh, once the technology is mature enough and we know more and there's business case calculations and, and we just have more information, 
I think it's worthwhile thinking whether the existing utility, utilities would also be license holders for this kind of, uh, uh, for the floating uh, SMRs. So this is, I'm not committing to anything and this is not a promise, but I think it's definitely worth thinking and, and worth discussing whether the, uh, organize it and, and utilize the existing competence on that area in Finland. I'm afraid time flies. Uh, we will have the cocktail reception soon. You take a right and go to the end of the hallway. But before that, we have to hear a couple hear a couple words from the people who actually paid for the cocktails and paid for me to do this study. So I will give the floor to Thea Dermanen, who we talk a little bit about the eco-modernists and, and, and replanet and, and stuff like that. So go ahead. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Thea Törmänen and yes, we are related and we share the passion in, for pro-nuclear environmentalism. So <laughs> that explains why we're both here. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I was a chair of the Finnish Ecomonist Society for four years, but now I'm uh, heading the campaigning efforts of Replanet, which is a brand new uh, umbrella organization for like-minded science-based environmental organizations across Europe. Um, a common society was started in Finland in 2015, and it was started by a handful of people who were really, yes, one of them is here at least. Yeah. I wasn't there, unfortunately, I came along a year, year later. Um, it was uh, started by a handful of people who were really tired of the, the level, the low quality of the public discussion regarding uh, energy policy in Finland. And so we started on energy topics, but then later uh, we started engaging in agriculture and biodiversity topics as well. And when I started as the chair of the Finnish Economic Society in 2017, I couldn't, I couldn't even dream that we had this uh, in international umbrella organization just a few years later. But we registered uh, Replanet this February in Belgium, and now we have uh, people working in 14 different countries um, for a common goal. We want to liberate nature and elevate humanity using the best mm. tools available provided to us by science. And we want to shrink the environmental footprint of humans to as small as possible, but at the same time making sure that ever, everyone can enjoy the high quality of living across the world, including the global south. Um, and we want to thank, I want to thank our funders, uh, Quattrocher Climate Foundation, Foundation from the UK and the Rodale Foundation from the US. Uh, they were uh, generous enough to uh, finance this report and this event. And they also continue to support our campaigning efforts across Europe as well. So let's replan it. Thank you, everyone. So... I know that you still have questions left, but let's leave it for the cocktail tables and, and have something to eat and drink and, and you can ask away and for the next hour, yeah, enjoy and uh, have a nice rest of the evening. Thank you. <laughs>